Guys, thank you so much for joining to this live session. Uh, my name is Hamid Hassanzadeh. I'm the founder of Parametric Architecture Platform. Uh, we have a very special and amazing and cool guest today. Uh, he's Michel Rochkind from uh, Mexico City. And Michel Rochkind is founding partner of uh, Rochkind Architectos. And according to Forbes Life, he's a representative of Mexican, ge Mexican generation of architects who uh, transforming the country and uh, he has been shortlisted uh, he has been shortlisted uh, to participate in several large scale international projects in Mexico, Canada, Kuwait, China, Dubai, Singapore and Spain. He has been a visiting professor at the Southern California Institute of Architecture or SciArc in LA and uh, at the Institute of Advanced Architecture of Catalonia IAAC in Barcelona. And Rochkin has uh, participated as juror of several international awards and competition and has lectured in many different countries. So if you would just stay with me, guys, I, I'm inviting Michelle to this live session. Hello. Hey, Hamil. Hello, Michelle. How are you, my friend? <clears throat> Thank you. How are you? Nice to see you here. That's you awesome. And, uh, That's happy to have you in my house. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. It's great to see you here. Thanks for joining to this live session. We're super excited to discuss with you about your architecture, your visions, your works, and your advice for younger generation. So if you have anything to say to our followers as a start, the mic is yours. You can say hello to our audience. Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining uh, from uh, wherever you are. It would be nice to uh, uh, exactly send where you're uh, typing from Brazil. We see you there. Uh, I'm in Mexico City. Uh, Hamid, thanks for the invitation. It's great to, to be able to host you here in my home. And I'll show you what you're, you were telling me that uh, wow. a little bit of how you can see the house on the outside. Wow. <laughs> you know? Awesome. <laughs> and the patio. You've got a really big windows and, uh, over there. Yeah, so, so nice light can come in, which is nice. And this is a, a house in Colonia, Roma. And, um, and yes, uh, I've been That's living brilliant. part time in New York and part time in Mexico. Uh, I, uh, after this whole pandemic started, I flew to Mexico because I wanted to be close to my daughter because she's here in Mexico studying. And, um, and now, We'll see what happens, but yeah, great to see you guys and receive you at my house. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you so Welcome. much. So uh, I'll just have a comment for our uh, audience. Please type uh, your questions in the questions box down below there. I will, I, I will try to check them all, uh, during the live session and I will ask them from the, dear Michelle. So if you have any questions, just write them into the box down there. So, okay, let's start. Uh, uh, discussion and uh, please tell our our audience who are you and what when did you found uh, Rochkin Architectos and what happened you start your architecture career. Oh, perfect. So uh, first of all, uh, well, I'm Michel Rochkin and I started um, architecture by 19. Uh, oof, 1990 something, 1997. <laughs> in a long time, guys. Long time and, uh, ago. <laughs> and, and yet, uh, long, 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 in a, in a long, long, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. No, and uh, <laughs> it was a really interesting journey because um, actually I come, I come from a musical background, as you were also asking, and this is something that we'll relate later. But uh, exactly. before doing architecture, Hamid, I was, I was drumming. I was a drummer in a band, and I was playing drums for, for a long time. I was playing drums. I was signed with Virgin Records back in the days with a band called uh, Alex Sintek y la Gente Normal. And, um, and the interesting thing about that was that uh, because I was touring with the band and going to different countries and playing, architecture started becoming more interesting to me and it started making more sense because I was able to see infrastructure, I was able to see uh, public spaces, I was able to see what, what the buildings could influx on people and the city. And so, um, I really started being fascinated with architecture because of my touring with the band. Because when I started to study architecture, I kept on playing. I never, I never quit drumming until 
maybe when I, when I uh, left school and I started now doing projects with clients, there came a point where I said, you know what? I think I need to concentrate fully on architecture, but I never, I never saw one or the other as a hobby. I, I always thought that it related to my passions and it related to the way I wanted to express a part of me that either was in music or was now in this case architecture, but uh, they really uh, were amazing um, uh, things that were interlinked. I never saw them separate. And um, in right. terms of architecture, Hamid, I founded a Rojin Arquitectos um, in 1990 something, but then I had two partners, which were Isaac Broid and Miquel Adria, who Miquel runs a uh, Arquine magazine here in Mexico, and he does Mextropoli, like the, one of the most important cultural events in the city. And um, we were partners for three years, which was very interesting to me because I'm a, I'm a younger generation than they are. So Isaac is part of this amazing generation that reintroduced contemporary architecture to Mexico at some point with Enrique Norten and with Alberto Calach. And Miquel was, uh, this, uh, is this architect from, from, from uh, Catalonia who came to Mexico and, and started doing the magazine. So being with these two beautiful minds and cultural people, uh, I had the opportunity to really connect to other generations that were not my generation of architecture. So that was very interesting to me to be able to uh, meet other architects from different ages that were transforming Mexico already. And that happened for, for three years. And then we split up, uh, we each took our separate way. And I, 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 I did Rockin Arquitectos again on my own in, um, in 2001, when I started doing the PR wow. house, this, this metal house right. for a ballerina dancer, uh, the Nestle Chocolate Museum and all this. And the interesting thing, Hamid, was I wanted to explore more. I wanted to experiment more. And I didn't, if I had partners with me, maybe they didn't want to experiment. So. I, I, I said, now that I'm on my own, there's nothing tying me back. I, 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 I can really experiment and explore. And if I, if I mess it up, it's, it's my time. It's my, uh, I'll learn from it, but I really want to push my thinking and my boundaries as a creative person no? uh, more than an architect. So this exactly. is a little bit how, how Rockin, Rockin Arquitectos started. Exactly, exactly. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, how this current situation with COVID-19 affected Rockfield Architectus? It, 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 it is affecting all of us, no? So uh, that, uh, it's, it, it's interesting because I feel that I've had more time in this quarantine than nobody because I, I, I quarantined in New York and then I came okay. to Mexico and now I'm quarantining in Mexico. So it's like all <laughs> the time. It's like, Please right. get me out of here. But, uh, <laughs> but I think this is a situation that, that has affected us all. I mean, the moment I got uh, back to Mexico, of course, I let everybody go to their homes. We're working from home. Uh, we're making sure that everybody, uh, first of all, stays safe. But also, um, as, as I always say, Hamid, if we have the privilege to stay home, how can we help the people that are less privileged? So it's our responsibility, not as architects, but as human beings, to be able to help other people. So even staying at home, we're, we're working, of course, in our architectural projects with our clients that we've been, we've been lucky enough to, to keep on going with our projects, not only in WeWork in New York, but also here with Rockin Arquitectos. Um, but how can we help uh, design other things? And, and, and we've been doing, uh, I have a, we've been doing from, from even a uh, mask, nah. uh, face mask right. that we're, we're doing here with a, a really good friend of mine, Carla Fernandez, who's a fashion designer. And we got right. to design these, these cool face masks that are about uh, sound bites, no? That be, if wow. I can see your mouth, I want to see kind of the energy of, of, uh, of you behind the mask. Behind. So, so exactly. any way of helping and, and giving them away for free, of course, I mean, I go out with my daughter and if we see people that are not wearing masks, we give them to them. So um, it's, 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 it's helped us in, in recalibrate and rethink many, many of the outcomes. I mean, and, and I've, I've, I've repeated this uh, over and over, which I think is very important. That is, uh, while we're here in our homes and we're rethinking of what this future or this new normality will be, I think one of the most important aspects of all is that we have to understand that we cannot design based on fear. We cannot design this new normal if we're going to design it from a place of fear rather than designing it from our humanity to understand how to provide 
this beautiful future that is not based on plastic bubbles and isolation and, and masks and everything. Because to me, this uh, and, and to everybody, I think we all know this is a health crisis. This is not a, we can design anything. And of course we can design the most beautiful plastic bubbles if we wanted to, but I guess that's, the, I think that's the wrong direction. I would hate to live in a world that now you can't hug. I want to hug more and I want to be able to, to have more contact. And I want my body to be healthier because I have these, uh, I, I've created these antibodies that make me uh, aware of the, the way that I eat and the way that I exercise and the way I need to uh, be on the outside world uh, and not be as scared of everything, no? But, um, yeah, right. but anyway, I think, I, I, I think this, uh, the most uh, interesting outcome would be how we come out of this stronger as human beings, first of all. Then, then we can talk about design and architecture and other stuff. No? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> How do you think this current situation will bring some kind of new regulations or some kind of new laws in architecture to design buildings or these kind of stuff? Again, I, I think that there, we're going to see big changes. I hope they're not based on fear again, because uh, if you take a quick example, what happened with with 9/11 when the when the World Trade Center a incident happened, the way we traveled changed dramatically. And everybody thought totally. it was going to be temporary, no? And, and that temporary stayed. And that, that became the new normal. So now traveling is a pain in the ass because you have to take more time because everything is like, and, and I don't want this to be the new normal after this pandemic, where you have to access a building and then you're going to have to take your temperature and you're going to have to be sprayed with, I don't know what, uh, aerosols or whatever before you can get in and then you have to go through a chamber. I mean, these are temporary things that I hope don't become the norm and I, and I, or the normal, no? So um, I would take the positive things that are happening, Hamid, which are uh, countries are understanding that you have to be more in contact with nature. So if you have to be more in contact with nature, does that, does that mean our buildings are going to have to be more open and, and connected to the exterior without creating these false environments of if it's cold outside, I'll put you, I'll heat you up. And if it's hot outside, I'll cool you down. So how do you make a smoother transition of all these things? Um, another thing that is very interesting to me that you're seeing now is that uh, some countries in order for, for restaurants that are starting to open to have the same amount of people, for instance, a restaurant that would have 50 tables, no? So they let the restaurant open with 10 tables, but maybe you can put 20 tables on the street outside because they made, made, they made it pedestrian. Right. So if that becomes kind of a trend where you can occupy a street because you're social distancing, which is okay for the time being, but then what happens when you realize that taking the street is also very beautiful and you start shutting down these, uh, some of the streets in the city that you don't need in order for the pollution to come down, for you to be more on the outside air, to help your body create antibodies because you're more, you're spending more time outside with nature that provides everything that we need. And I'm not saying, again, I'm not saying that, that there is no virus. Of course, there is a virus. I'm, 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 it's really shocking to see how many uh, people have died of this and it's very, but I think that we have to understand where the problem is and as, as humans try to connect back and design from human to human and not design based on fear and and again, become the plastic bubble guy that doesn't go outside and, and, and touch anything. So, so um, I think being aware of, of great opportunities and, and, and we've, we've all seen ideas pop out in all these websites, no? About, exactly. Oh, look at this, this restaurant that you are in this glass box glass. with your partner. Right. I'm like, <laughs> I don't want to have that type of dinner. I want to have dinner with my friend. No? Friends, yeah. And, uh, so, uh, exactly. but, but again, it's a, it's a longer discussion. I think that we are going to see changes that are very important, Hamid, which have to do with the time that you spend in your house. I think that the, the scheduling, for instance, when all humanity takes a vacation will no longer happen. We're not all going to go on summer. So maybe vacations are going to be shifted from country to country. So we all take, take vacations in a different time, which is great because then you'll be able to really take advantage of either the beach or the forest or wherever you go and not the same exactly summertime for everybody, no? Um, 100%, now we see so. that we can, now we see that we can work from home. So home becomes a place where maybe 
half of the time I do spend at home and the other half of the time I go to an office. And then I also cut a little bit of the commuting and I cut a little bit of the, 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 the horrible transportation and polluting because of the transportation and different things that make more usage of my house and also more intelligent ways of, of really relating, no? But uh, right. again, it's an 100%. ongoing conversation that we'll see this thing happen over time, no? Yeah, great ideas, actually. So personally, I follow your both accounts and wherever you go, you use a very special slogan, which says, run your city. So I love this slogan. And where does this love of running come from? And how does it let you to integrate with the city that you visit? Well, first of all, we all have to deal with our demons, no? I always say. And, uh, <laughs> and for instance, even, even, even in this quarantine, this quarantine made, made us, is making us go deep within our dark side as well. And we all have our dark side. So, right. so it's very important to really work on, on the things that you want to change as a human being, you know, as a person and the way you're doing things. So for me, running has, has been a sort of therapy. I mean, running became... Uh, not only a way of hearing my head and understanding the voices inside my head and having more clarity on, on the person having the experience rather than the person thinking you're these ideas in your head, no? But second exactly. of all, I started running in cities because the scale of running to me is very beautiful to understand and connect exactly and, and have a sense of orientation. If I'm in a car, the car is too fast. If I'm in a bike, a bicycle, I might get a little bit distracted because I'm using my bicycle. If I'm running, I think it's very important. Uh, uh, it's me, myself, and understanding of the place. So I started doing, for instance, uh, 10 kilometer runs in cities. And I would say, okay, 10 kilometers in Milan, 10 wow. kilometers in Paris, 10 kilometers in a place. And I would love it because First of all, I love running in the morning where there's nobody on the streets, no? So you get- What time did you, do you get up in the morning? Uh, five? Five, five, five. Wow, uh, quite early, that's brilliant. <laughs> and again, it, it's like you're seeing who's getting up at that time and you're seeing a, a little bit of, of uh, what's going on and you see, a, for instance, here in Mexico, it's beautiful because you have like the, uh, the informal markets and the informal uh, people putting stuff up on the street. So you're seeing the transformation in the street from very early in the morning, no? Yeah. And again, I love running without people because it be also becomes a little bit of my time on my own with the city itself, no? So run your city became... <laughs> run your city. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, yeah. If, we, if we take a look at the current cities, uh, inside the cities we see like beautiful and good buildings with nice materials, designs, with those like special facades and great solutions. But at the end, these beautiful, good buildings, they don't make a good city. And there are lots of problems in, into the cities that needs to be done, needs to be reconsidered or think about them. So in this uh, challenge, what are the roles of the architect? What do you think? I think that, I think it's very important that we rethink our responsibilities. And our, our responsibilities, I say, not only as architects, but as human beings, again, uh, who are we serving? If we have a client that is hiring us to do a building, are we serving a single client that is giving us the money or is the building for the people? And we need to serve even the people that are not paying for the building. Because mm -hmm. in my case, and at least what we do in Rojkin Arquitectos, uh, we're always thinking of what the building can do. Not what the building can do in terms of performance, which I love performance and I love uh, sustainability, yes but what is the building doing to the community? Can the building be a platform for the community to enhance in some way? Or is the building an isolated thing that doesn't even speak to the community? So, I mean, there's a lot of colleagues that we, where we've had these conversations about, um, we should stop talking about self-sufficient and about the self because it's very, it's me, 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 and what I can do, no? Let's talk about what the buildings do to the others, no? So. Exactly. I think that if we start understanding that we need to change some laws and regulations and say, okay, you're going to do a building. What is the building going to do for the community? Are you going to have workshops where you can train people and it becomes a, a bit of a school? Do you have a, something that is giving jobs or opportunity to people? 
Are you giving a little bit of your site as a public park so people can come and engage? I mean, what is the negotiation of what you're doing and what is the benefit? Not only what we've seen sometimes that, that maybe you enhance the street in front of you. Maybe the buildings, and this happens in, 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 in a lot of countries, Hamid, where, where maybe there's a certain tax that goes to another part of the city which is less fortunate, and that money helps a little bit of that community. But that, thing, that needs to be shown more. Right. That, I think, even now after this pandemic, and, and talking about the privilege of being at home and how I can serve other people with the things that I can do, how can a building serve uh, all aspects of the community or different aspects, and not only serve the wallet of the client who's paying for the building that wants to make a profit of it, no? <laughs> right, 100%. So we had Hanif Kara in this uh, live session uh, who was just trying to comment before I close the comments. We will have uh, the live session with Hanif Kara next week as well. But here he asked a question from you. Uh, he just wrote, uh, three architects inspired you before you start your work as an architect. Okay, well, first of all, <laughs> cheers, my friend. I'm gonna, it's a, I'm going to listen to you next week then. Yes. Um, <laughs> ask, ask, same, me, ask same I, question next week. <laughs> I'll ask the same questions to you. Um, <laughs> yeah, I would have to say, Hamid, that, that more than architects, and I can tell, tell you three architects. No, I mean, first of all, Herzog and Demeron have been a huge inspiration to me. Even uh, if you haven't heard their, their Pritzker Prize speech, I would recommend highly that you listen to it because uh, sure. I remember really, really well uh, about this, this uh, at least in Mexico, you know, this obsessiveness about you have to create your own style. You have to polish every detail that you do so everybody knows exactly your details of a building. And I said, I can't do that because I have different clients with different projects that they want to do with different budgets, with different geographical locations. So I can't repeat the same architecture everywhere. That would be a very bad mistake, at least in my eyes, because I need to respond to a tailor-made suit for, a, for every specific client because it's a very different condition. So when I heard Herzog and Demeron talking about their architecture, which becomes specific for each place, for each client, I was like, wow, this is beautiful to my ears, no? And, yeah. and of course, I mean, the, coming from Mexico, Barragan and the gardens and the, and the power of the words, no? using words like beauty and introspection and all these amazing words that I think we lost over time has also been a very powerful uh, influence, not, not because of the chromatics and the colors, but, but again, the, the most important or the, 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 the concepts that we, that we were taught in school, no? And, um, and Valerio Ligatti, I think now as a, as a uh, the way he, he's driven his architecture is also very interesting to me as a new understanding of how he's doing uh, uh, architecture. But, but I would have to say, uh, Hamid, that I have more influences of friends that are not, uh, or, uh, that are not architects. I love, uh, for instance, Stefan Sagmeister, who's a really good friend of mine, inspires me a lot because of his, uh, his, his amazing mind. Or, or even Bjarke. Bjarke is a really good friend of mine. And more, it's more about the things that we talk about in our discussions rather than his architecture, that I love the things that he's doing. And I think he's, he's I mean, he, it's amazing. Every, all the buildings that he's getting built, eh, but it's more about our conversations of our daily lives, no? Eh, right. I can tell you the same about filmmakers, no? Eh, there's filmmakers that I love that have influenced me as, a, as an architect. So, so maybe it's because of my background as a musician that, I don't like only talking about architecture because I think we're, we're, we're taking all these things that are cultural in our heads and we're trying to put them in, a, in, in something. But it, to me, the, the broader the conversation between philosophers, filmmakers, sociologists, anthropologists, the much richer your vocabulary as an architect and your way to react to society is much better, no? Exactly, exactly. So in this era that we're living in, it's really hard to stay in one discipline uh, because we're really living in the, into, in, in a in, in interdisciplinary world. So how do you think this situation works for architecture? And what do you think is the relationship of architecture with other disciplines? 
First of all, I think that the, the relationship to any other disciplines has to start, Hamid, with the openness of, of collaborating. And I, and I tell you this because as a, a thinking about my personal growth, upbringing, uh, when, I, when I played music, um, if I was in a, in, a, in a concert and I would see the, like these small concerts where you're growing up and you're playing with different bands, I would see somebody play and I would love the idea of, of contacting the guitar player after his gig to tell him that I wanted to play with him. And I would do that yeah. and maybe we would jam with different uh, types of musicians and so on. So when I left music for architecture, I thought it would be the same. And I started calling my friends like, oh, let's work together. And back in the days, nobody would collaborate. <laughs> nobody. nobody. It would be... That happened, that I mean, happened in architecture, yeah. Never. That didn't happen at all. I mean, now, now you see like all these new generations, they're super collaborative. And you, you, I mean, now, yes. Back in the days, it was like, no, no, no. I, don't, I never want you to come to my office because you're going to steal my ideas <laughs> and you're going to take away my drawings. So it was very, very difficult at the beginning to understand how jealous the profession was at some point. So, uh, so collaborations to me are, 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 are a must and they're a must because if you want to grow, you want to take in the knowledge of the, of the sociologist and you want to take in the knowledge of the guy who's doing the public policies in order for you to be creative enough to create something that is meaningful and has a more powerful outcome than just the architecture. So right. that's why I say it has to start with openness and for instance, in our projects, Hamid, what we have done most of the time is that when a client comes in and he's hiring us only as architects, but we say, okay, this is a problem that let's sit down first and let's restructure what the question is. No, what is the problem? So if you want to do a mixed use building, let me bring in people that understand what is a mixed use building now in the conditions of this city at the moment. So I invite a sociologists, I invite anthropologists, I invite landscape designers, and we have a conversation with the client saying, oh, let's reframe the question because if you're going to spend this amount of money and this amount of time, maybe the question is the wrong question, no? I mean, I, I always paraphrase uh, my friend Alejandro Lavena, who says that there's nothing worse than answering correctly the wrong question. Sure. So exactly. if, a, if a client <laughs> comes to you, you don't know if that's the right question or not, but it's your, at least to me, it's my responsibility to think if it's the right question and at least comment back on the client saying, you know what, maybe we should reframe it and do this, this and that. And for instance, uh, just to put some examples, Hamid, uh, the Nestle Chocolate yeah. Museum. Yeah. The Nestle Chocolate Museum, when we did that project, nobody asked for a chocolate museum. The, the, the actual brief was that they wanted us to go inside the factory and put graphics and make it like super nice for kids to come in and witness how the production of chocolate uh, happens. And we, we came back to the studio, we said, wait, there are no chocolate museums in Mexico and it's very important to us the history of cacao. So we should have a chocolate museum and I don't give a shit if the government doesn't do it. Uh, this is a transnational company that if they're willing to pay for it and open it to the public, that becomes a kind of a gift to the community because even wow. though it's paid by a private company, it's giving, it's giving and opening its doors to a community. So that's the so first without project having, that we designed. Without having, without having a client, you designed that project? No, no we had a client, Nestle, this, this company, yeah. hired, well, they, they hired, well, they, they, they did a small competition amongst agencies that would provide the experience of going inside the, the factory. And we came back saying, you have to do a chocolate museum. And they did it. Right. So, so here's where I understood that you can have the power to reframe the question and the power to make people think a little bit more than where they are. And not from the arrogance of the architecture saying, I'm here to enlighten you and we're going to, no, no, no. From the humbleness of saying, let me invite these other people to, sh to, give them, to give their ideas and, and their opinion for you to have a broader perspective on what you're going to do now. So that's been, that's been a, a common thing in Rojkin Arquitectos over and over. Every project that we have, we figure out what more can we do with the project, no? What is a better outcome than just what the brief is telling me that I should do? And yes, exactly. it's, a bit more, it's a bit more work, Hamid, but at the end of the day, we're very, 
I am more satisfied with the results because you see them, no? You see yeah. that, um, uh, for instance, Mercado, <clears throat> Mercado Roma or some of the other projects, uh, I can talk about the design and the parametric facades, or, or, but it's more about the social components that made a difference that at the end I loved. Because yes, I love exactly. design, but I, but I love trying to figure out how to connect these broken social elements that we have in societies and in our structures and communities, no? So um, exactly. I guess exactly. that's, the, that's the, the bigger part of, the, of the, our job as architects, no? Actually, you mentioned about your project. I'd like to ask about for a Bocha project. And the project aimed to bring like the, to the neighborhood, to bring the value to the neighborhood that was not in a really good situation. And would you please discuss a little bit about this project and uh, where does this master plan came to life? Well, I mean, Sorowoka was a very interesting project, uh, I mean, because uh, <clears throat> it was another, it's another project for the government where I was a little bit skeptical on, on working again for the government because normally there's not, they're not the best conditions. Normally there's a <laughs> super crazy times, crazy budgets, at, at least here in Mexico. And there's a, a lot of other countries that might All be parts related. Of the world. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so when this project came to be, and uh, it was interesting because I remember the conversation with Miguel Angel Yunes, who's the mayor, was the mayor of Boca del Rio. And I remember him honestly questioning people saying like, what, what do you feel proud of about being from Boca del Rio, no? This place where it is in Veracruz. Yes. Yeah. And people were not proud of a lot of things. They were like, no, we're proud of Veracruz as a port. No, that's Veracruz, but what do you feel proud about this area, which is Boca del Rio? So he put together a Philharmonica out of nothing. He brought in a, 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 a music director to come in and, and start seeing the people that were musicians and started teaching a lot of the other people and bringing more musicians to create the orchestra. So even the, the, the beginning of the project was already beautiful because uh, by the time I came in, they had already had a successful Philharmonica that was playing in different parts. So we had to do the house for the Philharmonica. And uh, also another thing that was very uh, interesting to me is that our client, uh, uh, we went to see different sites and the, the site where we chose to have the project was the, the place where it was more deteriorated. It was the place that uh, a lot of people didn't go there because you have the strongest north winds, so the sand yeah. uh, covers the streets and it's a bit more complicated. There's a lot of constructions that were left abandoned, like uh, two or three levels, and then they forgot about the construction. So we said, well, this could be a great site to really make it something uh, worthwhile after this happens. No? So, so I remember that we started talking about the project and there was a, a big wave breaker uh, there, uh, Hamid. So the wave breaker was an abandoned wave breaker where you would find diapers and needles and broken bottles of beer. And, uh, right. and fishermen still went there, but it was really bad. So uh, we talked about what if we do the house for the Philharmonica connected to this pier where we, where we put lighting and we clean it up. So we make this connect to the outside and make it beautiful for, for people that might not even go to the uh, Philharmonica. So that's what we did and from day one we presented it as a master plan that would eventually change the zoning of all these buildings that were abandoned or, or left there and um and we started doing the the, the photo Boca. and photo Boca is a, is a is a small venue because it sits 980 people on the inside but it also has recording studios it has another another theater that you could use it for djs new uh, uh, film or doing different types of events and it's been very successful because they use it uh, all year round. It's not only for the Philharmonica itself, a little bit of, as what we did with the Cineteca Nacional or the National yeah. Film Institute here in Mexico, where, yes, we did the theaters, but we did spaces on the outside for people to gather and you have concerts and you have theater as well. So it's very beautiful that, that uh, something can serve as a platform for many things to happen. Mm -hmm. And um, so coming back to Puerto Boca, one of the most beautiful things is that everything that is ha happens on the inside, is projected for free on the outside with the music. So the mayor oh. uh, said at some point, I said, he said, I want everything to be played on the outside for free. I don't care. And That's people fine. were saying like, but, but people are not going to pay the tickets to go inside then. And he said, no, no, no. 
the person that wants to pay a ticket will pay a ticket. What I want to do on the outside is start giving the people that might not come here a little bit of new classical music or a little bit of what's happening on the inside. So they, are, they, they at least get a little bit of the culture for them to be inspired to then maybe buy a ticket and come inside okay. and see what's going on. No? So, okay. I mean, it has nice social components. No? Now, now they do the book fair, the most important book fair around the area. They do it inside the space. And they do yoga classes on the outside and on the terrace. So, so again, it became kind of this uh, interesting uh, catalyst of things to happen around the area, no? Exactly, exactly. Actually, you mentioned your Sinteca Nazionale Museum. And if we take a look at this project, uh, we see more than a building which tries to bring people together, tries to uh, engage with its users or make them to experience new it's to gain new experiences. How does a project like this can go beyond from just being a building to a land of new experiences? In the case of Cineteca, which is another government project that we did with, with, with our office, it, it, first of all, it sits in an area, Hamid, that is like fully developed now in Coyoacán. So now they're doing high rises. So this became sort of an oasis, no? When we got the project right. back in those days, it, I remember uh, wanting, to pe wanting people to understand exactly the dimension of the site because that was never, never understood by people that would go to the, the, to the Cineteca. So creating kind of a public space, first of all, for people to gather and to come around, that was great. And I remember, for instance, uh, the original brief did not include an outdoor film uh, space. So we worked closely with the government and back in the right. days with the, with the director of the of the Cineteca, eh, Paula Storga, and we work with her to say like, oh, let's do the outdoor cinema because people would love it. With the climate that we have in Mexico, an outdoor cinema is amazing. So we provided the outdoor cinema. Eh, we provided, eh, again, uh, different areas that, that provide space for people that might not even go to watch a movie, no? And that's the beauty that you see today. I mean, I think that, exactly. eh, I don't remember the numbers, but I think that, Everything increased like three times the, the, the people that would go to the Cineteca to buy tickets to see the movies. And now they're done by Mauricio Rocha, a very good friend and colleague. And, um, but the people that go there just to spend the day or hang out or have a coffee or, or I mean, or read a book is just amazing because it did become this amazing space in the middle of this dense area now in Coyoacán. So again, yeah. I, always, I always have this, I always say that as architects, we're incredibly neurotic and we want to design 300% of everything. And I think <laughs> that's a mistake because if we don't leave certain areas undesigned or, or, or left for us to witness how society is exchanging the way they live today and technology, and, and then we can understand and learn from all these spaces, how we need to handle the new projects that we're going to be doing in the future. So, so it's very important to learn from these spaces that are, they're designed, but they're designed for that. They're designed for us to understand exactly. these new ways of behavior, no? Exactly. But uh, that also is, is never taught at school. Every, most schools want you to design everything and tell everything. people what to do in every single, <laughs> no, but, uh, 100%, right. So uh, we have a question from one of our audiences. I will just pop it up here. So Vasya Joe asks, what was your biggest challenge you faced when you started your practice? Oh, that's, a, that's a great question. And uh, I think that the most important thing when you start your practice, the most difficult is being true to yourself. Is, is right. actually, being true to your beliefs, being true to what you think you can give to somebody. If you're just being complacent to somebody like, oh, I'm going to do a, I'm just going to do this and, and be a good boy and behave and, and, and answer the questions correctly. I think you're missing out on the way you see your life. So that mm -hmm. when, I, when I was talking at the beginning in, in this conversation, it was more about seeing things as a human being and th seeing things as, 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 as a society, as a community. So keeping true to yourself when you can work with a client and you can share your ideas 
that you can share certain uh, uh, worries and concerns that you have about how societies are changing, about the politics, about the economics. And that's why I, I always say, learn more and be open to things that are not only about architecture. Read more about the different things that can impact the way you do architecture and the way it gives you strength to be true to yourself and to be really a forceful in a good way, not in an arrogant way, like, oh, I'm this intellectual that can, that can give you all this. No, no, no. From a human point of view, I think that this is the right solution for this problem. And I think we should question this, this, and this before we sit down and design. So yeah. whenever you're starting doing your practice, just be true to yourselves. See where you're coming from and what, what are your strengths as humans as architects as thinkers of of certain communities and societies no awesome awesome uh, we have another question from one of our audience i will pass over here alexi Asli asks if he was a youngster now would he still choose architecture or another field like music what do you mean i'm still a youngster now. <laughs> <laughs> for sure <laughs> If I was a youngster now, uh, no, I, I love architecture. I, um, uh, music at some point, at least in Mexico, I didn't want to pursue a, a, lo a life career of music because, uh, it, I mean, I think that the best outcome you have as a musician in Mexico is being a musical producer or working with a, with a, um, uh, with a musical uh, company, you know? So architecture has the beauty to age very well with time. And I think that architecture as a profession is in, um, incredibly, incredibly uh, important for the human aspect. So, so I would definitely still have chosen architecture. I mean, I studied film at some point in New York. I, I took a, a summer course because I love film. Uh, and I would also maybe at some point in my life would like to try out um, doing some, some work in the film industry uh, I have some ideas of scripts that I had there, but but definitely architecture and design in general. No, I had an industrial design company also called Agent that we worked for a long time doing product design. So, so I would definitely be doing something creative and and uh, which uh, which has a creative output on on design for sure. No. Yeah. Right. Sorry, I couldn't close this question box here. I'm just trying. <laughs> I I switched camera actually a couple of times. So I'll ask my another question. Uh, till that time, I'll try to, to close this one as well. So as a Mexican architect, uh, how would you define Mexico's contemporary architecture? It's, it's, um, I think that the movement now is amazing. You have incredible young offices doing amazing work. Uh, and I think that um, it's very responsive, no? Responsive in terms of, the way we build the materials that we use to build architecture here in Mexico, the craftsmanship that we have, um, uh, the certain situations and conditions about politics and economics that make this uh, the result of what we have. And again, you have, you have great firms. And I love not only seeing these young firms uh, being successful, but I love young firms that are uh, also couples, men and women, or then a, a two-person firm or a four-person firm that you didn't have that much before, talking about all this idea of collaborations that before you would see that nobody would want to collaborate, no? But, um, but uh, yeah. I, th I think that it's, it's a very interesting way of reacting to what our conditions are and what materials we're using. And, and again, the crafts, uh, which in the case of my work, I'm always pushing to find new materials, no? I don't care about what, what are the standards. I'm not, most of the time mm -hmm. I'm like, what if we try this metal and what if we try this pre prefabricated JFRC or what if we try this aluminum panels? Because right. I also like exploring and testing uh, with, with uh, uh, things that we have and with craftsmanship, no? Um, right. Which is interesting because even the, when, when people uh, talk about what the, the work that we do in the office, if it's too international, it doesn't uh, maybe re resonate with Mexico. I'm like, what are you talking about? everything is done with this amazing craftsmanship that we have in Mexico. So I would, I, I would not even think of doing these projects someplace else because in, in some other place you might have a factory that does it and it, it ships 
to, to the site already done. In, <laughs> yeah. in Mexico, it's the beauty of the welders and it's the beauty of the, of the, the craft that, yeah. that I think it, the workers that I think uh, we have in, in, in a lot of different countries, no? Yeah, exactly. The, the, question, the question is still there? <laughs> It's still there. I tried to close, but uh, just, I don't know. Is it just my phone or? See, see if you can pop up another question. Maybe that'll get rid of that one, no? Okay. Let's do that. Okay. So, there we, go. Asks, there we go. What is your favorite book behind you? in your collection right now yes right now my favorite book is this one what is the and name it doesn't have to do anything the untethered soul it doesn't have to do anything with architecture it's about us as oh, humans brilliant so, brilliant uh, so i would highly highly really really recommend because again what is happening in this quarantine? This quarantine is making us reconnect to ourselves. So in this reconnection of ourselves, and I think that the job is to be better as, first, better the things that we can better from ourselves in order for exactly. us to really go out there and, and, and do the architecture that we need to do. So, so uh, this, this in terms of, of, uh, of non-architecture, I'll show you what I'm reading, which is sure. interesting. So, Essentialism, also. Yeah, I saw it in book. your stories. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I started it, but this is a this is a great book about a, I mean, the pursuit of less. How we really deal with understanding what we don't need and all the the stuff that we can transform into something that are essentials, no? Yeah, and um, exactly. Richard Sennett talking about a. a Craft, no, and the the craft. Craftsman, yeah, the so craftsman, right. The, the import, the importance of, of craftsmen. So, so as I was uh, telling you a bit before, there, yes, I love seeing architecture books, and of course, I have a lot of stuff that that is that is interesting here, even from, even from our books, <laughs> from yes. Rocky, which are yeah. which are st awesome. stuff that we didn't end up uh, uh, publishing, but. Uh, but yeah, even though I like, I love seeing colleagues in architecture. I really love putting things in my head that can expand my thoughts on, on how we're interacting from, again, from the heart, from human to human, and again, being careful not designing out of the wrong aspects. And coming back to this pandemic, saying, let's be careful of designing the new normal out of fear because we're going to have right. a really bad new normal, no? So exactly, anyway. exactly. Actually, we have 10 minutes left to our one hour. There are two essential questions that I want to ask them. Uh, so first, first, first one is, uh, what do you think about our platform PA? Okay. Next one. Uh, so <laughs> I'll, answer, I'll answer this one. First of all, Kevin, okay. you're doing a great, you're doing a great job. I, I, I think that um, thanks for showing us all these projects that are happening around the world. Thanks for bringing people together. And by the way, I'm looking for somebody that wants to work with us, uh, even from home. Yes, parametric design and form shaping. Please, yeah, uh, talk to Hamid first, and then he can send somebody to me. Thank you. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I think that it's also very important to understand. I think there's a lot of dialogue that can happen through your platform, Hamid, that has to do with. Yes, how much of it is parametric and how much is the human knowledge and hand um, in, in interjecting through programming the results, no? So what are the right. human aspects or the craftsmanship aspects, even in the programming? Because the, cr the programming is a craft. So exactly. it's interesting when you, when you talk about uh, programming, people are like, oh, that's the computer. No, no, I mean, the people that we know how to program, we know that programming is a craft. Yeah. And then understanding how to fabricate uh, what you're programming in a computer, in the computer as a tool for fabrication, and then getting the workers to understand how to do the craft for the mm -hmm. fabrication. So mm -hmm. I think there's, there's a broader conversation that it would be beautiful to see. 
and coming back to even this book from Richard Sennett about the craftsman, talking about the craft of programming. I think that's, I'll leave that to you so you can, you can uh, <laughs> I'll work talk on about it. another time. <laughs> yeah, thank you. The second question is, uh, as closer with those experience, all these experiences, all these lectures, teaching experiences, what kind of advice would you like to share with young generation? Like students, young professionals, architects, designers, what would be your advice? I think that it will go back to the other question that we had, Hamid, about staying true to yourself, no? Because um, I don't know if it's because where I come from and the different background of being in music and, and different uh, things that have influ influenced my life, but I remember that I would hate going to an architectural conference and the architect being kind of this untouchable God on stage that would exactly. have all these amazing words that were like all these high resolution that you would say like, oh, that's, that's really, I would never get there, no? And I would hate that because yeah. I, would love, I would want to see, I would want to see the guy up on stage telling me, that yes, he fucked up and that he messed this thing up and he learned from that and he's, he's understanding how to go in a new direction. But I, because you learn more from the mistakes than of course from, your, from the things that you do correctly. So, mm -hmm. so 100%. Being, being relaxed enough to understand who you are and not wanting to be this other architect. No? Like, oh, I'm going to put on the suit of the architect and now I'm going to be this, this architect who has to speak this way and talk this way. And, and, and build a character. It's like, what character? Why? We, we want to be in a world where, where people are people. We don't want to see characters. So, exactly. so I think that, that really staying true to yourself is something that is very powerful because nobody sees the world the way you see it, I mean, or the way I see it. No? So there's different perspectives. And I think that's, that's very beautiful when you can nourish the power of where you come from, the way you see communities, the way you see the interaction the way you're dealing with this pandemic now and the way you're going to come out of this and have this uh, understanding with this new normal or this new world that we're going to face. So, so again, just, I mean, be, be, be strong enough to really work the aspects that make you the person that has something to say, you know, that has an opinion, that, that can build architecture even before putting the bricks on the side, you know, that you're constructing thought that leads you to construct and to build architecture. Exactly, exactly. Uh, thanks for the questions and thanks for the answers. They were great. Do you, do you think you will have time for another question? Yeah, yeah, let's, let's do one more. Let's okay. do one more for sure. Okay. Are we gonna pop up another one? Mm, yes. Okay. <laughs> Simone asks, which are the things that inspire you through your work? Actually, I think you somehow answered this question. Yeah. yeah. You want to me... try another one or? Yes, try another one. Well, you're popping the other one up. I think that inspiration comes in, in, in everything, no? I mean, I have a 15-year-old daughter, Simone, and, and uh, even the conversations with my daughter are incredibly inspiring because seeing how she's dealing with this pandemic and how she understands the world through her age and her and her consciousness of the world is amazing because at some point I, uh, when, when her generation grows up, I will have her generation as, as future clients also. So understanding things, but I, as I say, read a good book, go watch a good movie, have a good conversation with your friends. And that's what really uh, triggers kind of the inspiration. No, exactly. So Mr. Mandark asked, actually, I was going to ask this question as well. And, but maybe we didn't have time. How does your music pass? help you in your architecture? That, what was its effect to your architecture? I, I think that the most important aspects for that is that it doesn't have to do with the rhythm and cadence because a lot of people say like, oh, you were a drummer, so maybe your architecture, there is a sequence of, no, no, no. I mean, uh, of course there's narratives about writing a song that there, there's the narratives in architecture, but I think that the most important thing was really putting things that were not architecture in my head as a creative opportunity to expand my thoughts, no? And right. uh, I'll put you an example. I remember that I was, for instance, working on my draft board because yes, I used the draft board before using computers. 
<laughs> so, uh, You're from like, that generation. <laughs> yes. Uh, but l luckily transitioned very well to the, the computer. But uh, yeah, great. Uh, so, so I was there. You, like, you've experienced and, uh, the world without computer. <laughs> and, uh, yes, and I remember sorry. that I would. Uh, no, it's okay. I remember <laughs> that at some point I would not know where to go. I was sketching, and then I said, "Well, I was like stuck, no." So I would leave the paper because I needed to get on the bus and go on a tour to play uh, in a town uh, that night. And I remember playing and being on the concert, playing the drums. And because I was so distanced from the architecture and so engaged with the music, I would remember some great idea. So in between songs, I would grab a pen and a napkin oh. and I would sketch the idea because awesome. it would help the architecture. So, and, and if, if, if I create an analogy of that, it's like sometimes when, when you want to remember a name or something that you can't remember, no? And if you're thinking too much about it, you cannot remember, but the moment you relax and you're doing something else, the name pops in your head. So I started understanding different creative inputs in my mind as a way of nourishing my head as a, as a, as a creative uh, being, no? as, as a person that wants to design. So that's when I left the music and uh, I was only doing architecture where I also went and took a course in film because I said, I want more information in my head and I want more that doesn't have to do with architecture in order for it to enhance the architecture, which Impressive. I don't know if it makes sense, but, uh, but yeah, a little bit like Impressive. that, guys. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for this brilliant discussion and all the answers were really great and they were such an inspiring. Uh, thank you so much. Do you have any final words to say to our audience? No, thanks to all the people that connected and uh, thanks, Hamid, for keeping the, the great job, uh, the, the great platform. Uh, let's broaden the conversation. We have some really good friends in common. Uh, exactly. and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and yes, I think that now more than ever, these discussions are, are really important. Where do we want to go? And again, so I would just leave it at everybody that's listening to us that's a designer, please do not design from fear. Design from the heart, design from heart. generosity, from inclusion from connection, not from fear, guys. Like, we don't want to live in a world that is based on fear, no? Exactly, exactly. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a nice day. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Take it easy, Amir. Adios. You. Goodbye. Adios. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> okay, guys, thank you so much for watching this live session. Uh, we had a really brilliant conversation and such an inspiring conversation with Mikhail Rochkin from Mexico City, the founder of Rochkin Arquitecto. Uh, please stay tuned with us with the forward uh, with the next uh, upcoming live sessions. On Wednesday, we have with Confederation Fox, James Bond. And next week, we have with Hanif Kara on Tuesday. So stay tuned with us and we'll keep inspiring you. Thank you. Goodbye.